Let's get it together. Yes, sir. Cap. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Do you still hear the echo? Yeah. Still hear echo? I don't hear it no more, but I can see that text. I got it. I'm, I'm gonna take care of that. So we're gonna we're gonna get started. We're gonna take care of that part. So we wanna thank everybody who is who's on, and uh we apologize for this is our first time actually doing this. We apologize for the um, for those that are in for this for these technical difficulties, but we're going to get started. So first, I want to say that uh, we want to start doing these uh, recordings maybe every Sunday. And in the city of New Orleans, what we have been doing is we have been doing these. I have a testimonies for for some years. And the purpose of this is to give people an opportunity to hear the stories of some of our great workers in the Nation of Islam, and then they can bear witness to the work of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And to, I think it's quite fitting, and I really am honored that the person that we have today that's starting this off is none other than our brother, brother student, Captain Emeritus, brother Captain Dennis Muhammad. So welcome, brother Captain. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Salam alaikum. And Ramadan Mubarak to Brother Captain and everybody else who's actually on here. So without going down to it, Cap. So there are many believers who have, you know, whose lives you have touched, right? There yes, sir. So you have helped inside and even outside of the nation of Islam. And there are many historic moments with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan that you have actually been present where during these very historical moments in the Nation of Islam and um, just in the history of black people in general in America. But many people know about your great accomplishments, your support of the minister, but I don't know if many people know about your journey to Islam. So can you begin this? I have a witness, I have a testimony of this 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 segment telling us how you came into the nation of Islam. First, let me say this: we thank Almighty God, Allah, for blessing me to be able to not only be a witness bearer of the great work of the Honorable Minister Farrakhan, but bless me to be able to share this great testimony. I want to thank the first and foremost, the most Honorable Minister Farrakhan who have allowed me to be able not only to walk with him, but to grow, to be the person I am today. And I want to thank you, Brother Minister Willie, for giving me this opportunity to share part of my history and my journey and walk with this great man. My coming into Islam is a little, is a little funny story, but it's a true story. So since you always like me to keep it real, yes, then I'm going to keep it real. When I was about 17 years old, I was living a very, as most young men my age too, and I was living a very thug life. And I had got caught passing bad checks. And they got me for grand larceny. And I was 17 at the time that I committed the crime, which means I was a juvenile in the state of Ohio. You know, when you don't become an adult till you turn 18, so all your Crimes are called juvenile crimes. And so because the day that I went to court, I had turned 18, the judge found it very befitting to uh, sentence me as an adult. But one of the funny things, and I must tell this, you know, you always got these jailhouse lawyers, all these brothers in the street tell you, man, if you do this, the judge going to do this if you do this. Yeah. So yeah. one of the brothers told me, he said, listen, man, if you get up there and you get a chance to speak before the judge sentences you, then she may be lenient. What you need to do is tell her that you want to go to the service and to the army to serve your country. <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm taking this advice. So I get in the court, and um, so 
so the judge was getting ready to pronounce sense. Excuse me, judge, can I say something? And he said, yes, sir. I said, judge, you know, I would like if I give an opportunity to go and serve my country and then listen to the military. So the judge said, well, that's very favorable of you. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna give you 30 days to enlist. And if you don't enlist in 30 days, then I remand you back to the court and pronounce this 30 day sentence on you. And when the judge said 30 days, I said, man, this is all he's gonna give me was 30 days. I think he's gonna give me three years. I said, I'm getting ready to go to, go to the army for three years and not serve 30 days. So I left out of there and I knew I wasn't gonna go to the service. And I got around to the 30 days where I went back to the court. And the judge said, listen, young man, since this is your first adult crime, I'm gonna let you taste a little bit what our new county jail like. So, you know, okay, all right, I'm trying to be hard as nails. They take me, take me to this county jail. It looked like that sheriff just put his key in the wall and the whole wall opened up. And I look in there, look like a big old vault. And it was all these three men cells, seven men cells. It looked like, looked like brothers was caged in there. So they put me in the seven man cell. I walked in, you know, young jitterbug, trying to be hard, right? Mm -hmm. There was a Muslim brother in there. And he was, I never forget, he was laying on the top bunk. He was reading something. The other brothers was over there playing some Tonka, playing cards. So I walked in, he looked at me, you know. So as soon as I walked in, the brother, the Muslim brother, he said, um, brother, have you ever heard of the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad? And being the ignorant Negro that I was, I said something, man, to, to this day, I don't even like to tell you what I said. <laughs> but I said, man, uh, I heard that MF don't do nothing but take you niggas money. Lord, what did I say that for? That Muslim brother jumped up off that bunk. He grabbed me. And he put his forearm underneath my neck and pinned me against the bars. He said, look here, little young nigga. You're going to respect him, and you're going to respect me. I said, yeah, yeah, okay, baby, all right, all right, brother, okay, okay, okay. So he let me go. So the other brothers sitting over there playing cards, they looking at me like, yep, the young boy that really tore his behind. So, you know, I'm over there minding my mind, I'm minding my business all this time, looking at my man, you know? So about dinner time came. And when dinner time came, they had served us, and I never forget that meal. They served us a bowl of potato soup, a cheese sandwich, and a bologna sandwich. So I'm looking, you know, then I see the Muslim brother, he goes over to the toilet and he flushed the bologna sandwich down the toilet. So I'm thinking, well, man, he just don't like bologna, right? Right. So I go over. I go over there and tell the brother, I said, listen, brother, you know, next time, you know, you know, you give me your bologna sandwich, I give you my cheese sandwich, and I think that's a fair exchange. Now, the brother's over there eating to my right, he's looking at me like, oh, no, he didn't ask, he didn't do that. And so the brother, the Muslim brother said, look here, young brother, I would not give you nothing that I would not eat myself. And I looked at him, I said, this is the same dude that trying to choke me out. <laughs> but he's concerned about my health. Now, I got a little confused at that point, right? So all that day, man, I'm thinking, you know, it's got, it got into the, in, into the night. Everybody's resting. He's still reading. So I go over there and I said, uh, excuse me, brother. Man, forgive me for what I said, man. And tell me something about that man, Mr. Elijah Muhammad. Wow. And for the first, for the first 15 days, I didn't do the whole 30, I did 15 days and let me out. But every day, that brother, I never forget him, may God be pleased, his name was Brother Ares. Mm. He taught me. And when I got to the last day of me being in there, I had a great love for Islam. I was a Muslim. Mm. And I promised, I promised him that, you know, when I get out, I would go to the temple. He said, brother, please, you promised me? I said, yes, sir, brother, I promise. I left up out of that correction facility. And of course, you know, I meant well in my promise, but just like all Negroes, you know, I went back to business as usual. But I got into a situation 
where me and another brother, <laughs> man, I don't know if y'all want to hear this. is crazy. Yeah, this, is, this is, you want to hear it, brother? Got to hear it, man. So anyway, I got with an old friend of mine. We took some, <laughs> we took some acid, right? Some yeah. orange sunshine. I had what you call at that time, it was called California curls. It was a process, basically a process, but I had a very long hair and head. Long, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of hair. I mean, and I mean, we used to take great pride when we go to the to the place and get our hair, we call it get it busted. And God bless me, man, that you know, when men get their hair done, they really put an extra emphasis probably more than women. But I used to get my hair done and women be envy looking at my hair. Well, anyway, so uh, I was on a trip, man, so <laughs> I took this orange sunshine. It's on a Friday, right? I'm tripping. I'm really, really tripping. And so uh, I'm at home, man, and on Friday, my man normally come pick me up, and we go over here to this place called Sandy's Hot Dog, I mean, uh, burger, burger Shop. And, you know, that's for all the cars and ladies and, you know, everybody styling and profiling, right? We do that every time. So I'm getting ready, man, and I'm tripping, right? So I'm getting ready. I need to walk, take a shower. So I'm sitting there saying, man, if I take a shower, I'm going to mess my hair up. My sister wanted to go roll it. It was too late. So I said, I tell you, I'm going to take a bird bath. Right? Everybody know what a bird bath is. Good thing, you know. But then as I'm taking this bird bath, right, I'm looking at the man, and the man talking back to me. So I'm talking to me, right? Tripping. Yeah. So the man said, look at you. You stink. You need to wash your behind. But you're so concerned about how you look with that hair. If you for real, cut it off. I don't know. Just having me a pair of scissors right next beside me, right? I'm challenging my science kit, cut it off then. So I grabbed a big patch of it and I clipped it off. And I knew it was too late, then I then I started clipping. And as I kept clipping the hair, I was I feeling free, right? And I'm like, man, this thing, this hair was a bug, it was costing me. I really didn't like it. I was doing it because of the compliments. And so I jumped in the shower and I feel like I was reborn again. Yeah. Little did I know I didn't do a thorough job in cutting this stuff off because I'm tripping, right? I got patches here, patches there. So I never forget, brother. I went down the steps. My man, he blowing his horn. I see my mother. She's sitting on the couch. She said, oh, boy, lost his mind. <laughs> so I go, I say, bye. I runs out there. Now, my man had a cold-blooded, everybody used to know, man, the, the LS98s back in the day, they was, they was the bomb. I jumped in his car. He had a black on, black wheat. When I jump in the car, he looks at me, right? Right. Hey, 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 you all right? Now, I'm not knowing, man. I got patches. I'm looking crazy as a whole lot I said, yeah, man, let's go, let's go. So he looks at me like, yeah, OK, man. So we drive over to the spot. So he, he kind of concerned about my mental state of being, right? So uh, here come the ladies, man. They come over to the car, you know, and I'm normally was I ain't never had no problem with no women at that time, you know what I'm saying? So, but but they go on his side, one of the girls, they're on his side, look at this, she looks over at me, so she says, what's wrong with your boy over there, you know? And he said, uh, uh, he'd be okay, he'd be okay. So lo and behold, who's coming, selling selling the uh, Muhammad speech to everybody in the crowd, who's minister, our, our local minister here in Columbus, our minister died there. He's selling the Muhammad speak. So he comes over to the car and he says, Muhammad speak, brother. That's when it hit me that I made a promise to the brother in the joint that I would go to the temple, right? I said, hey, my man, my man, where, where, where the temple at? Where the temple at? He said, brother, it's right down the street. I said, man, y'all got the meeting? He said, yeah, now this is on a Friday. You know, back in the day, on Alam Elijah Muhammad, you didn't have a packed house on Friday. Matter of fact, the minister that normally teach on Friday was that minister that the local minister didn't let him teach that much. This was his opportunity to teach. Right. I never forget the brother, may God be pleased, name was Brother Minister Stanley. I don't think Brother Minister Stanley converted nobody in his life but me. Well, anyway, so, so I get something, I tell my man, I say, oh, my man, I'm gone, man. I'll check with you later on. So he was so happy I got out of this car. I know my man was happy. I'm working with Minister Darnell down to the to the, uh, 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 the temple. <clears throat> That's what it was called at the time, the temple. I get up there on the front row, man. He got me, ain't too many people in there. And so this brother, Minister Stanley, he looking at me, so he said, okay, there's a fish right here. So he started teaching. I couldn't wait to raise my hand to join. I don't even, if you ask me, do I remember what the subject was? 
Now, I, I, I don't remember the subject. So uh, I raised my hand and I joined, right? And so I accepted, he shook my hand. So they took me downstairs. Now, I was still kind of tripping, right? And one of the brothers, never forget these names are very important to me because I got to give him an honorable mention. His name was Brother Charles. He wound up being the imam down here at the local mosque. But Brother, Minister, Brother Charles was a brother. And I never forget, he said, Brother, you like a cup of coffee? And that's when we were making an egg, egg coffee, right? I said, yeah, you, know, you can smell the coffee all the way outdoors. That's the way the Muslim's coffee was. He gave me a cup of coffee and a slice of bean pie for my first time. Brother, when I drunk that egg coffee, man, it sobered me up. <laughs> I just left. Now, next thing on, I'm sober as a judge, right? Pie, so now I'm walking home, right? I'm walking home. I'm filling my head. I'm trying to recall what happened. You know, I'm trying to play, do playback. What, what, what happened, man? I'm walking. So sure enough, I get halfway to where I hang out with the fellas. And there was my whole crew, man. They looking at me. Oh, man, what's up, man? How you doing, man? Said, yeah, man. I'm with the Muslims now, man. I'm with the Muslims. I'm joining. I'm a Muslim. And they said, so two of the dudes, who, they was my homies. They had just got their hair done, man. I'm looking at their hair. It's glistening. And, oh, man. They said, oh, OK. Yeah, man, you look good. But we get ready to go get high. We see you later on. <laughs> So, man, I walk the whole man, that was the longest walk, like, like, like a three mile, man, dead man walking. I finally get home sitting on the porch, man. I said, man, man, how did I go from getting high early today? Now I'm a Muslim. So, okay, okay, it is what it is. So later on that night, here come my two guys. They had got their head, they got a little high. So they were standing out downstairs, I mean, in front of my porch. And so one of them said to me, you know, because I'm finally cleaning my head up. One of them said to me, he said, yo, man, yo, man, you look good, man. You look, man, you know what? I'm cutting my stuff off, my I'm going to join the Muslim, which, man, you know, misery loves coming. I said, yeah, man, cut all that stuff off, man. Ain't no, you, you look like the white man with all that hair, man. <laughs> the, next day, the next day, both of them, man, God is my witness, man. They cut their stuff off. That was on the Saturday, that Sunday. I got an old suit from my brother. I was so happy. I went to the mosque. And I never forget Minister Wiley, who was our locally man. Minister Wiley, let me tell you, Minister Wiley was the brother who married Minister Farrakhan's daughter, Sister Donna. Sister, Sister Donna was our first lady right here in Columbus, Ohio. Wow. And Minister Wiley is the son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's brother, John Muhammad out of Detroit. Wow. And so, you know, so we had, we had, we said, we had some holy blood up here in Columbus, Ohio. We had Minister Fox, John's daughter, and we had the only like Muhammad's nephew. I joined the nation, brother, let me tell you. So me and my two partners, oh, man, what day, man, what day we out there selling the Bible speaks, right? Now, we ain't got an ex yet. And we blazed up before we went out there, man. You know, we fired up a couple of joints. So we out there selling the paper, we blasted, man. So the lieutenant first officer, he rolled up on us. He said, man, y'all been, they used to call it reefer then. Y'all been smoking reefer? And so I said, uh, oh, oh, we, we ain't supposed to smoke that? <laughs> man, he looked at me and said, you know, damn well we don't smoke no reefer, little young, slick nigga. Y'all come in there. Man, I ain't never heard, of, I ain't never heard the first officer cuss. And he, cause he was always kind, man. He just looked like a, he just like a, a epitome of a, of a righteous Muslim, man. That man cut called me. Man, let me tell you, young nigga, something blah, blah. And man, from that day forward, he was letting us know, you're not coming up here with all that slick stuff, man. Cause we was the best evidence. You see me? You think all of us up in here with some squares? You're looking at some of us who came from the worst part of the daggone uh, uh, side of town. Hmm. So I straightened up, man. Next thing you know, I got my ex. And I've been in the nation of Islam ever since. Wow. I know my story's kind of long. There, no, we, listen, man, that, 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 that's, that's, that's good. I think we, we, we got to know those stories because in, in each of our stories, there's something that we can learn. Who would know that your first encounter in Islam came with the man, you disrespecting the, the teachings in prison? And the man, and the man putting his forearm against you in the prison, right? Look yeah. at 
at where, but look at where it is today. So I guess it's not where I, how our story begins, but how it, how it ends and it, how it's going. So we thank you for that. Here's the other question, Cap. You know, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us about how Master Farah Muhammad told the messenger to take plenty when dealing with our people. And you have been a part of the F team and you've been around the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan where you have seen him take plenty. Is there anything like when you talked about with the late uh, wife of uh, uh, Malcolm X, can you share, if you don't mind, that experience where you saw how the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan took plenty and what he told you? Wow, brother. <clears throat> I'll never forget that day. The minister was invited to speak at the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus in Albany, New York. This was in 1984. Reverend Jackson was running for the presidency of the United States and uh, he invited the minister and Jesse was there and the minister carried, uh, he was the keynote speaker. Believe me when I said it was that speech that the minister warned the Jewish people not to harm a hair on Jesse's head. Mm. Matter of fact, it was that speech that got the minister in trouble with the Jews that he's in trouble with them to this day. It was that speech. Well, while I was there standing next beside him, I was behind him on security. We didn't have that many brothers. But because I was the student minister in Buffalo, New York, plus I had came from Chicago, where the minister sent me from Chicago to Buffalo. Prior to me coming to Buffalo, I was assistant supreme captain under Theron from 1980 to 82 in Chicago. And then from 82, the minister sent me to Buffalo and I was the first one there. So I took on the ministry role. Well, I was standing there and while the minister was throwing down, I mean, he was throwing down. Betty Shabazz uh, was brought up on the rostrum and took a seat. Now, I could see her, but the minister didn't know. He was teaching, so I'm looking at her. But I'm really feeling some very negative vibes, right? So I, okay, okay, I'm going to roll with this. So the minister threw down so tough, man, the people was on their feet. And the minister went to take his seat, and, they was, and the choir started playing. And as the choir stopped playing, when the minister took his seat, he looked to his right, and that's when he seen Betty Shabazz. So the minister immediately got up and went over to her. And I'm, you know, I'm right behind him. And he went to put his hand out to, to grab her hand, and she snatched the hand back. And she said, listen here, keep my husband damn, keep my husband's name, she used some swear words, I don't even want to say what she said, out your mouth. She said, my husband got you off of drugs and da-da-da-da. You know, and I didn't know about that part. But the way she, she was talking to the minister, not only was it so insulting and disrespectful in my eyes, I there's me talking, but it put a bit of taste in my mouth like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're not going to talk to the minister like that. Okay, who you are? But I, I held my, my posture, and the minister, he, he just... He just, he just, he just took it like a, like a child being chided by his mother, man. He was, he just sit there. He was, he's, he was bent down. He, he was humble. He didn't say nothing. The minister went back to his seat and he sat down. Now I'm, I'm looking at the minister. You can see, you know, he was disturbed. So I ain't say nothing. So Jesse said, "Well, everybody, let's go downstairs." They went down to what they call the fellowship hall. Well, evidently Betty didn't come down, and the minister was sitting over there, so he's by himself. So I went over to the minister and I said, Brother Minister, sir, what should I have done? Mm. The district two, I, I said that to him. I said, Brother Minister, what should I have done? The minister looked up at me. What you have, what you have done, you wouldn't have done nothing, brother. Mm. He said, even if she spat in my face, I was to take it. He said, I had not seen that woman in 20 years since Malcolm's assassination. He said, we like family, brother. He said, I would, Malcolm would drop his children over to my house, and I would drop my children and my wife over to his house. Mm -hmm. He said, she waited 20 years to give that to me, and that was what I was supposed to take. You hear me, brother? Yes, sir. Said, yes, sir, brother. Yes, sir. So who would have known, dear brother, 
that 10 years later, that Corbila, Malcolm X's daughter, hired a hitman to assassinate the minister. It was very well known. It got in the national news. And of course, they arrested Kabila, Malcolm's daughter, for which he attempted to want to do. But I remember the minister got with some of his top neighbors, and he told them, he said, listen, I'm not going to let this government who set her up take away Malcolm's daughter. And he told Brother Leonard and some of his national neighbors, reach out to Betty. And I'd like to talk to her and see what we can do to help get her out of this situation. And I said, wow. So I get a call. I'm the captain. And now, this 10 years later, I'm in New York. I'm the East Coast Regional Captain. I'm in New York. So the minister calls from his office, Supreme Captain Sharif calls his brother. The minister wants you to pick up Betty Shabazz at the airport and bring it. And they gave me the location to bring it to. Wow. And I said, I said, man, why are you sending me, man? You know what I'm saying? You know how I felt about that situation. And the brother said, the minister said, you know it. I know it not like that. You know what I'm saying? So, so she was not going to go to this meeting without Hakeem Motobudi, who out of Chicago. That's who she wanted with him. So he, I had to wait for him. And I brought both of them to a disco's location at the airport. So we are here, you know, the minister in this meeting with Betty, all of the national labors, Mother Khadija. Uh, it was a nice little meeting in there. I'm on the outside. We got it on lock for security. So the door opens up, and who comes out? Mother Khadija and Betty Shabazz, and they hold on the arm like old school buddies. And so Mother Khadija says, Brother, Captain, where's the bathroom? Master, this way, but Mother Khadija. So as I'm walking, they're behind me. I'm walking up to the ladies' restroom. The thought that was in my mind was, damn, 10 years ago, this lady cussed the minister out. Wow. And 10 years later, she's reconciling her differences with the minister. And I thank the minister that he took much and he was patient. And he didn't respond out of that emotion of anger that I was feeling. Wow. What kind of man is this? And they went to the bathroom and they came back and they had the big old Apollo meeting where for the first time in 30 years, we settled the Malcolm beef. Mm. A historic thing took place at the Apollo Theater. Mm. And I witnessed it. Wow. And the Malcolm era was settled and they dropped all charges on Kabila. And there was not a real chummy chummy relationship with Betty Shabazz. It was it was a relationship, but it wasn't like sitting around kumbaya kind of relationship. And of course, the rest is history. Man, that that now that's something that's a full 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 360, huh? How that how that act oh. uh went, man. That that is that's something. And as we'll keep going now, you know, uh, over the years, you've been in the Nation of Islam and uh, the regional captain in the East Coast are over a very significant mosque, mosque number seven, and rest in peace to our brother Hafiz Abdul. Yes. And you have seen many come and many go as it relates to being helpers and aides of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And me, many people come and go or uh, fall back in there helping for a variety of reasons. And you and I had discussed one time before how much of a role disappointment plays, right? And many of us yes. in our own lives, we go through those things where we face disappointment. And you shared a story that really helped me to understand how to handle disappointment. Can you share that with the audience who are, who are here? Well, you know, um, I listened to our great... Um, Assistant Minister, Minister Farrakhan, Brother Minister Ishmael today. And he shared a personal story about him and this argument he had with the God on taking uh, Mother Tanetta. I can relate to that. 
because it was real. I had a situation, brother. Uh, I owned a restaurant. Well, not me. I was a partner of a restaurant, but brother, uh, former Captain Henry and another brother by the name of Gary. We owned a restaurant called Number 7 Steak and Take. It was on 145th and St. Nick. It was 147th and St. Nick. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful restaurant. And um, these kind of businesses, you know, we're easy in New York to run up a gas bill so high that it was on a Friday, and never forget, they cut off our gas. In order for us to get our gas back on, we needed about $6,000, $5,000. Man, we didn't have $5,000, but I know, man, we got to get this gas on this Friday to weekend. That's when we make most of our money. So I never forget Brother Henry said, uh, Brother, why don't you ask the minister for it? Now, I have never, man, even conceived in my mind ever to ask the minister for anything. I, I just, that was never the team's attitude. We, you don't ask the minister for nothing. He gave me life. And so I said, no, sir, brother, I had to ask the minister. So as time, you know, was going by, we couldn't figure out where to get the money. I'm by myself. I'm wrestling, wrestling. Should I? Should not? Should not? Should not? Should I? I said, okay, man, let me swallow my pride, man, you know, and ask the minister. I made a phone call, brother. Sister Sophia was the minister's personal secretary at the time. She knew me, and I said, sister, I said, this is difficult for me to do, but I told her that my gas was cut off. I need to get back on. It's going to hurt me real bad. And the minister would give me the money, but get it back to him. And so she said, okay, okay, brother Dennis, I'll, I'll tell him, you know. And then when I hung up that phone, man, and I was sweating, you know. God, I'm saying, well, I'm glad I did that. I'm glad it's over with, right? So I'm waiting, I'm waiting, you know. I'm waiting by the phone. Hour go by. Two hours go by now. I'm concerned because we're trying to get it before five o'clock. And I ain't getting no phone call, man, you know? Mm. So, you know, my mind start going through all these changes, man. Man, I ain't never asked the minister for nothing. And I've always been there. Why, well, you know, you know, as, as Satan begin to play on your mind. Well, anyway, I sit back, man, and I was upset, man. And as I look up to our ceiling, you know, we had these ceiling towels, but one ceiling towel was missing. And as I was looking up, I seen two big pipes. And I said, I wonder what the I said, I wonder, is this the gas line? And there's another gas line. I had forgot that when we purchased the building, about six months later, we bought the next building next beside us. And we just knocked a hole in the wall and took the other side. But <clears throat> we didn't know that it had its own uh, independent gas. So the gas was on on that side. So I called our plumber. I said, brother, can you splice that line together? And, you know, he said, yes, sir. I got to go turn it off. And he died. I said, well, do what you got to do. Man, my man goes, he spliced the line together, running in one, turn it back on, and we back in business, right? But I'm still bothered that the minister didn't call me. We in business, you know, I mean, look at this thing is like a toothache now. Now in my mind, I'm saying, man, I put my life on the line for man. And did all this for the minister, man. And I ain't never asked for nothing. He don't come through for, it bothered me, brother. It really ate at me. So I remember the Supreme Captain now, he went to Supreme, he was the sister Supreme, brother Mustafa. He was coming into New York to pick up, he had just purchased a nice Benz. And uh, he was I was taking him to go pick it up. And the minister was speaking in D.C. So he said, hey, D, come on, man. Jump on in, man. We ride on down to my new short. And we go hear the minister. I got in, but I really didn't want to go, right? I get in, we ride. So he said, what's up with you, man? And then I tell him the story. I tell him what happened. And he looked at me and he said, man, you better get that out your mind, man. What's wrong with you? So we ride a little further. So then Moosey says, Moose, he says, probably Sophia didn't even probably tell the minister. He know that wasn't true. I know she wasn't going to be one not going to tell the minister. But he, he tried to make light of it. We ride a little further down the road. So Moosey looked at me and said, 
damn, D, this really bothering you, ain't it? I said, yes, sir. You call your man, you call your man to, to help you out. Your man don't, that's how Moosey said, your man don't come through. Mm -hmm. He said, man, when we get to D.C., man, you got to talk to Pops. I said, yes, sir. So we get to D.C. It was early, about 5 in the morning, 6 the minister downstairs, having coffee with him, Rep. Uh, ben Chavis, and some other people. So he sees his son, so I'm like, I'm signing. Yeah, and, he, and I don't know, because the mind is playing tricks on me, man. Like, the minister looked at me like, oh, here he come. One want to borrow some money. Now, that's in my mind, right? That's real. <laughs> That was in my mind, like he looking at me, oh, hey, this dude will cut a ball, somebody, right? So I don't say, not goes, I agree to miss somebody, but not the way I normally. So that evening, the minister, he goes and he speaks at Willie Wilson Church. Man, the minister throw down so strong. Man, I got fired back up again. I'm, all that crazy stuff was out of my mind, right? So we at the airport, seeing the minister off. So Brother Mustafa says to me, he said, hey, D, did you talk to my pops about that? I said, oh, man, no, nah, man, everything cool. I don't need to. He said, oh, no, 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 sir, no, sir. Mustafa grabbed me, took me over to the medicine. He said, Brother Minister, Dennis got something he want to talk to you about. And I sit down, right? I said, well, Brother Minister, I called you. I called uh, Sister Fia and told her that I needed 5000 I told him about the, 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 the gas. I told him that. I needed the money and, and I looked up there, and, but I seen these two pipes and, and a lot, you know, and I said, and we want, other way I told Brother Miss, we wind up getting it on and, and, you know, that's okay. And so the minister said these words. He said, my God covers the shortcomings of his servant. He said, Brother Dennis, I got the message. He said, but that day I had took care of the taxes on the Salam restaurant. I took care of a couple mortgages on some of my ministers. And his word, this is what he said. And number two is down to the bone. He said, she knew it. She could have reminded me, but I didn't think. He said, but brother, who told you to look up? He said, that was God. He said, Allah knew that I would have, but I didn't know. He said, but it was God who covered my shortcomings. All praises do. He said, now here, brother, I'm going to write you out a $5,000 check. And he pulled out his checkbook. Wow. I said, oh, no, sir, brother minister. I said, no, sir, no, sir, brother minister. I'm cool. I'm all right. Mm. And I was so thankful to Allah, brother, that Mustafa did that. Because if he had not allowed me to tell the leader and what it did to me, to know that he did get the message, made me feel good. To know, man, that he showed me it was God that showed you, which made me feel good. And to tell me what he had did for everybody, I don't even tell you the numbers he told me. And he said, I would have, but she didn't bother me. He was hoping if Sister Sophia would have came back to him and told him, he would have did it. And that took such a big weight off of me. Mm. Because if Mustafa had not did that, that seed would have stayed in my heart. Seed of discipline. And under any other circumstances, it would have nourished. And I may not be the brother Dennis you're talking to today. Mm. I may have been a sour brother Dennis, mm. a spiteful brother Dennis, a vengeful brother Dennis. Mm. But I thank Allah, man. Oh, that Mustafa did that. And man, when he said that, he went to write. I said, no, sir, brother minister, no, sir, no, sir. I'm all right. You had just gave me life again. Mm. And that was that, brother. True mm. story. Wow, that, that, that is something because, you know, we talk about how it was disappointment that made Cain the killer of his brother Abel and made... Um, a guy who was considered to be a traitor in American history, Benedict Arnold. It was it was disappointment. So we'll go to that. You like I said, I started off. There have been so many historic scenes you've been on with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and one of them uh, is centered around one of the you know one of the challenging or controversial aspects of our theology. This was in nineteen. Well, this was the press conference where. <laughs> 
Muhammad of the Lord's Farrakhan made this bold declaration about the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that was contrary to what people thought about that took place in 1975. And you shared with me, and you kept it real, you know. Can you talk about that experience? Man, you, you pull, you're pulling out all the stops. All right, all right, all right. I guess this was the purpose of me doing this testimony, right? Yeah. All right. The minister gave what we call the great announcement, where the minister revealed his vision. It looked like every camera in the world was at the National Press Club and he was given that press conference. He didn't tell many people what he was going to say. I think there was only maybe two or three he shared it with. I'm sure Brother Jabril knew, Mother Khadija knew, and I don't know who else knew, but we, did, we, we didn't know. None of the body, at least I didn't know. I don't think no member on the security team, the F team, knew what this press conference was about. Mm. So, of course, you know, those of you who know, I was what we call on the diamond appointment. Everybody know Captain D was the point man. Point man is the man that the minister is behind. And I lead the minister on the stage and I lead him off. So one of the great things, if you ever been in the military of the point man, if you are on point in the military and during a time of war, the point man's job is to draw attention to those who want to kill and shoot and set up the rest of the soldiers that he may draw the fire first. So if there's a would be, you would hope the point man would get you first to be able to get your principal out the way. So I always knew that if anybody was gonna take a temple in the minister life, I would pray to Allah be me first and that get the rest of the team enough time to get the minister out the way. Mm. So I normally lead out first. So sure enough, I lead out, you know, man, all these cameras, da -da 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 right? So, you know, I'm trying to make sure I get a good position to be up in that camera, right? Making sure I'm all up in the camera. Yeah, okay, I think I'm in the, I'm in the mix. So the minister comes out, right? And when the minister start telling his vision and how he was taken up on the mother plane, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like at all on the first <laughs> The first thing that came to my mind, I ain't gonna lie to you, a lot know we came to mind. I said, damn, man, these people gonna think we crazy as hell. And so, so anyway, uh, I start, I start uh, making sure, excuse me, brother, I lost, I lost, there we go. You're back. So I start, so I start easing out the camera. <laughs> you know, I'm sliding a little bit over here, sliding a little bit more over here, right? Uh, true story. And listen, man. And, uh, and, and you know, I shared, I shared that with the minister, right? Years ago. Minister bust out and laughed. He said, Brother Leach, Brother Dennis, you was honest. I'm sure a lot of them wanted to ease up out that picture. But that's a true story, brother. True story. Mm. Wow. That's that. That's something. And there's so much. This is one. We're going to get to this. I'm, I'm going to jump around a bit. You know, uh, in addition to the history that you have in the city of New York, you also play, you also have a history here in the city of New Orleans. You've been in and out here, talking at the mosque, talking to the community around uh, issues of police brutality, issues of us uh, as a community, uh, accepting responsibility to reform our communities, right? And you were also involved in something that that you, like there's a testimony that you and I talk about, but a lot of people don't know that about this, your experience here dealing with the New Orleans Police Department in a community and guidance of the Honorable Minister Lewis Farrakhan and as it relates to Hurricane Katrina. Because we talk about how oftentimes when people are talking about the Honorable Minister Lewis Farrakhan's divine identity, they, they declare it and just declare it. But we talked about how important it is for we can actually show that what people read, like the Dead Sunday, what they're reading in their Bibles, bears, there's, there's actions that we can show of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan that line up to what we read about or what they're reading about in their scripture, which they thought took place 2,000 years ago. So I'll give the context. Brother Captain Dennis 
was invited to the city by the former New Orleans Police Chief Superintendent Eddie Compass. And Brother Captain Dennis, prior to coming here, had already had contracts with various law enforcement agencies around the country from the relationships that he developed, where he would go in and he would provide training to the community, but he brought retired law enforcement officers, many of them black, who would come in and teach the law enforcer, right? And Brother Captain Dennis, you can go and Google this, he was given a contract by the city of New Orleans to come in. And I'll never forget, hearing him speak helped me to get a better understanding of law enforcement, I have to be honest with you. He spoke to a room of men, women, black, white, different races, all of it. And after he finished speaking to these, the top brass in the New Orleans Police Department, they were coming up shaking his hand, thanking him. Because what Brother Dennis was showing them, he was saying that, listen, you all have become desensitized. And as a result of you becoming desensitized, you see everybody in the black community as a potential criminal, right? So Brother Dennis was given a contract. It was put all on the news. But this Jewish rabbi, Rabbi Cohen, came back, and Dennis, Brother Dennis would talk more about the details, but he opposed that. But you all are gonna be amazed, brothers and sisters, when you hear him tell this story and how it aligns up with what we read about in the New Testament. Go ahead, Brother Dennis. Thank you, dear brother. That was probably, uh, I guess every time I think about it, uh, dear minister, uh, it's a heck of a thing, you know, when you know a Lord used you. And I didn't even know I was being used. But yes, uh, our great friend uh, at that time, former Chief Eddie Compass, who loved the minister, Mayor Nagin, the mayor there, who loved the minister. Eddie Compass gave me a contract to give sensitivity training to his department. I was excited about it. He was excited about it. And he went to a religious dinner, an interfaith dinner, clergymen's, Jews, rabbis. And of course, the issue of crime came up. And so Eddie Comp is bragging that he's bringing in, and, he's, and when he said this, he said it like this, I'm bringing in Nation of Islam, uh, Captain Dennis, to give our department training. And he said it with great pride, thinking everybody was gonna applaud that. Well, as soon as he used the word nation of Islam, it draws the controversy dislike of the Jewish rabbi who was present and also members of the FOP who kind of felt that, you know, the nation preached racism. And so uh, I didn't know this. So I, I, I mean, so it rose up. So I get a phone call uh, from the chief. He said, hey, man, uh, I think you need to come <clears throat> here to New Orleans and explain, you know, there's a lot of controversy. And that's when I started reading, you know, and they were saying that, you know, the nation don't, uh, don't like women. We don't like, oh, there was just some terrible stuff in the newspaper. <clears throat> I flew into New Orleans, and so Chief Eddie Compton set up a meeting with his command staff, all of them, but lieutenants, captains, assist, all his top brass. Now, clearly, Chief Eddie Compton had already had a problem because he was ordering many of his patrol officers or his staff and the men under him to wear their police cap. And they had a problem because New Orleans is hot. So he wanted them, everybody put their police cap on. So they were a little upset with him about that. He shared that with me. So he wasn't a favorite. So when I walked in, Minister Willie was with me. Thank Brother Captain Jason. Room packed. This ain't nothing but brass. Ain't nothing but lieutenants, sergeants, chiefs, and deputy chiefs. Wasn't no rank of fire. But I didn't know in the room also was Rabbi Cohen. And so I did what I do. I mean, they were so pleased. They looked at him like, well, we don't see no problem with what he just said. And so Allah blessed me to, to woo them over. And as I remember, as I was walking out the room, Chief Eddie Compton was patting me on the back. You did it, you did it, you, you sold him, you sold him. 
So he said, but we got a meeting with Rabbi Cohen in my office. I said, okay. I don't know Rabbi Cohen from a can of paint. I don't know nothing about it. We go into this meeting, Minister uh, Willie there, myself, I think Captain Jason, Rabbi Cohen, and there was another uh, Jewish fella there. I can't remember his name. And so, <clears throat> so Rabbi Cohen starts off saying this. He said, well, let me say this. This is a Jewish holiday, and we should be observing it. But today, I came out because I feel that we can't have no organization, no nation of Islam that is like, uh, he said, the train, our police department is really like having David Dukes or the KKK train our police department. I'm totally against uh, Louis Farrakhan and your relationship, uh, 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 Captain, has been tainted. Mm. And this is what he said, Yo, you have been tainted by your relationship with Minister Farrakhan. Now, and man, when he said that, man, I, I kept my cool. And then he said, uh, so no, 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 we would not have that. So I said, uh, first, let me say this. Don't you ever compare us with the KKK. That's right. We never lynched nobody, killed nobody. And even the difference we had with the Jewish community, we have never physically went to blows or gave a Jewish person so much as a bloody nose. I take that as an insult, Rabbi, and I hope you don't say that again. Did I not say that, Brother Minister? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, Dad, he said, uh, okay. And uh, and how be doggone somebody, now the Eddie Compton wanted to jump in because he see I was getting ready to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So the guy tells the Rabbi, come on, we're going to do the interview. So the Rabbi gets up. So he's going out there to do this interview. I sent one of the soldiers. I said, go see what he's going to say. And that rabbi went out that room and made that same statement, referring to us as the KKK, after I said to him, that's an insult. So anyway, we, uh, you know, we leave there, right? We leave there. I'm at the hotel getting ready to leave, and I call, uh, you know, that evening, we were told to go to the community, have a community meeting, right, Brother Minister? Mm -hmm. So we were going to leave there and go to the mosque. And we were going to meet with members of the community. And of course, Eddie Compass was going to meet us there. So we left there and we were on our way to mosque. And then when I get there, I'm there. And I see one of his lieutenants, the captain there. Place is packed. And I saw Brother Whisper Myers said, listen, man, uh, the chief is not going to be able to make it. He was in a car accident. I said, what? He said, yeah, we in the, he was in the car accident, and he hit this, this old lady in the car. You know, he's in the hospital. I said, oh, wow, I'll be OK. So he, he, the, 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 uh, the other uh, officer said, I'm, I'm here. I think it was Rowley. I'm here. Yeah, I think it was Rowley. I'm here in his behalf. So um, I started speaking about the relationship between the law enforcement. And there was a brother there who stood up very, very, very strong in opposition of us meeting with the police department and my desire to train them. And he was so adamant, you know? And uh, as he got through, I think I said something that kind of embarrassed him. Everybody kind of laughed and he sat on down. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, the next day I'm about ready to leave. I'm about ready to leave the next day. Now I got a contract with them. So I, uh, I get a call from a news reporter. He said, Captain Muhammad, this is so-and-so of so-and-so news, and I'd like to ask you a question. He said, um, what do you think about Eddie Compass repudiating you and rescinding your contract? I said, rescinding my contract? I said, I, I don't know nothing about that. I said, he said, could you really check on that for me? Because like, we just got it on the news. So Minister Willie, he said he heard it. He called me, he said, brother, you know this dude, man, we send the I said, what? So I called the chief's personal secretary. I said, sister so-and-so, I said, uh, are we still on with the cut? And then you could hear it in her voice. Captain Muhammad, 
He's under a lot of pressure. He's not well. I said, oh, my goodness. This dude folded on me. Now, he wouldn't answer the phone. He wouldn't answer the phone. So I, 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 the, the, the news reporter called back. Well, is it true, Mr. Muhammad? I remember a story that the minister did when they tried to spring this thing about him and Jesse and what he said to the news reporter. And I said the same thing. And I said, well, if my brother rescinding the contract would take away the controversy and stop them from wanting to pursue to remove him as the police chief that this community need, then his rescinding the contract, I accept. Took away any power of the devil to show any controversy. But when he hung up, man, I was mad as all outdoors. Mm -hmm. So as soon as that was over, it was all in the newspaper. Look what they said. Uh, uh, New Orleans Police Department gave Louis Farrakhan, top man, the boot. Oh, there was so many articles, man. I mean, and, and you know, and when you, when you, when you, it's, it's something when you hear the, the, the read the story about how they hate and talk about the minister, but when they about you, you be like, oh, oh. So anyway, anyway, um, man, I got on that plane, man. I left out of there, and I was totally, totally, totally upset. Hmm. And as I was on the plane, leaving them out of there, a day or two after that, now I'm getting ready to sue. Some lawyers called me. One gonna sue the, called gonna me. Sue the city. Huh? You was going to sue the city of New Orleans? I was going to sue the Man, listen, I had a sister told me, you got the biggest lawsuit, and I'll do it for free. Well, I'll do it after we do it for a percentage. I said, okay. You don't have to give me nothing because it was truly racial and religious discrimination. And part of the city giving any money, you cannot give money on any, to anyone on religion, on racism and all that, but you can't be that yourself. So I had a life, nice lawsuit. So on my way out, two days later, I hear a brother call me and said, man, man, you hear about this hurricane we got? Hurricane Dennis? They called the hurricane, hurricane Dennis. I ain't paying no attention. I said, yeah, they need to call the hurricane Captain Dennis. <laughs> but I did not know the magnitude of this hurricane. So I'm looking at the news. They call it the Category 5. And it's getting ready to make sure. And da, da, da. So I called Brother Minister Willie, and I said, whoa, man. I'm thinking now, you know, they had that New Orleans attitude. We didn't see many hurricanes. We're going to weigh it out. We ain't, we ain't evacuate. So, okay. so Brother Minister said, Wait, before you go in there, like you were going, like you were making a decision to sue the city of New Orleans, but first you wanted to get consultation from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah, yes. But this was this was after. Oh. When I called the minister, this was after. But okay. anyway, yeah, this was after. This was right. after. This was after. No, no, no. You right. You right. Cause it's yeah. Okay. So yeah. right. That's right. So anyway, you right. So I'm getting ready to sue. I'm getting ready to sue. And um, so I said, let me seek advice, you know, from the minister, right? And so the minister heard about it. It was all in the news. Matter of fact, Brother Sutan said they asked the president about this. And he said he heard about it looking into the matter. So I don't even know how I got all the way up to the White House. Damn. So, so, um, so I called the minister. I said, Slamenango, uh, Brother Minister. I said, Brother Minister, um, I know you know what happened, and I got a lawyer, and she's telling me she got a great case. I got a good case. And I'm getting ready to sue the city and the police department for what they've done to me. And sir, uh, I'd like to get your advice. So the minister said, uh, well, brother, he said, all lawyers think they got a good case because they win whether you lose or not. They win. And he said, well, brother, what about how you going to leave my believers in New Orleans? You sue the police department, but they got to be the ones who, ex who get the wrath of the police. How you, how you leaving my believers? Mm -hmm. Then he said, and you suing the police department? He said, brother, 
you'll never do another training in no police department around the country after that. And that really caught me. I thought about that. I said, man, I'll be out of business. Okay, all right. So I said, yes, sir. I said, Brother Minister, thank you for your advice. And the minister said it with a strong, I have not given you no advice yet, brother. I said, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, Brother Minister. And then the minister, in this beautiful way, he said, now, brother, if it was me, this is what I would do. He said, the press is going to be there like a feeding frenzy because you're going to go against your own kind. Brothers that respect me and love me. He said, I would take the high road. Mm. He said, listen, brother. He said, what they're doing to you is a sign of what they want to do to me. Mm. He said, brother, the Bible says, and quote this to them, when you bring a people peace and they reject that peace, Lead that sick, he said, shake the uh, dust from your feet and leave that town quickly. For it's better for Sodom and Gomorrah mm -hmm. to escape judgment than that town. Mm -hmm. He said, brother, any time that you don't give a people an opportunity to address their grievance, you set up in them anarchy. And brother, when you tell them that, I guarantee you, you ain't got to worry about ever worrying about are you gonna get more contracts? You will get more contracts. You hear me? I said, yes, sir, brother minister. I got with brother minister Willie. I told him what the minister said. And we both drafted up the press conference. But now here it came. Dennis had came, was came, and, and, and I want to say this part because this was very important. I'm on a plane and I read the USA today about this Hurricane Dennis. That wind up family went back out to sea. And I'm reading the USA today and it said, Dennis is a sign of an unusual hurricane season. What came to my mind when the minister says, you a sign, brother, of what they're going to do to me. And so it, it touched me. I went, wow, snap, crackle, and pop. I'm looking at it. The minister said, I'm a sign. Then it used to have, okay. We hold the press conference on July the 1st, the very first day of the Essence Festival, right? Brother Minister was Essence Festival. That was Essence. So the press, you know, they showing up because, you know, May and Nate, he's over at the, over at the, at, at the, at the center. And so uh, me and Brother Minister, we there, and we hand out the press release. <laughs> you can see as soon as they start reading that I wasn't going to sue the police department and I was going to take the high road, that wasn't no news to them. You see some of them were breaking the cameras down, right? I don't even know if we got on the six o'clock news or not. We may got a little news, but it wasn't what they wanted to hear. They were there like a feeding frenzy. But when they seen that we wasn't going to go after our brothers, the love the minister, they start dissembling their cameras. Soon as I left out of there, and all y'all know the history, that right after Hurricane Dennis went out the scene, after that press conference, I left that town quickly. And you know, family, Hurricane Katrina became a reality. And let me show you, and this is with me and my brother, Minister Alway, Brother Minister, Minister Willie keep talking about, that this was not no coincidence. Because the minister had already told us that Allah was going to destroy a major city. I don't know why we thought it was going to be Los Angeles. At least I thought it was. But then here's what unfolded. What unfolded with Hurricane Katrina were several things. The day that it hit, it was called, uh, what was called decadence, the day of decadence. This is the thing they do in, 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 in New Orleans, right? It's called the day of decadence, right? 
Southern decadence. The day Katrina hit was the day of decadence, which was where the homosexuals parade up in up in the uh, uh, French quarters. Am I right, Brother Minister? Yes, sir. Yes. Now remember what the lesson says. It is better for Sodom and Gomorrah to escape judgment than that town. But we were looking at Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm. When I called, I was so happy that our student minister, Brother Minister Willie, that man did not waste no time. And my brother got the believers out of New Orleans. I mean, look at here. See, Dennis was a sign. He had, well, I missed that one, but I'm telling you what, I just believe that the reason why Dennis did not hit shore is because we didn't get the believers out. But, but that's what I believe. So God gave another reprieve, a stay of execution. He gave him a stay of execution for another few more weeks. Minister Willie, he got the believers out way before. And my God, Katrina came in, and that chick tore up New Orleans. And let me say this to you, family. The minister was going to see our brother in prison uh, in Philadelphia. What's his name, Mama Jamal? What's his name, brother? Yeah, Mamiya Jamal. Yeah, he's going to see him. And we picked the minister up in Pittsburgh. Just the truth, family. Katrina's taking place. The minister gets off the plane it's the truth he sees me he said brother what did you do to new orleans and i said oh no sir brother minister no sir what did you do to new orleans and the minister said this is what god would do to the least of his servants man chills came all on me family I mean, God did this for me in behalf of him, really. And, and we get to the hotel, we get the ministry visit. So the minister's at the hotel. We're looking at CNN News, right? So the ministry looking, I remember Steve Harvey called the minister and Brother Minister, what's going on? The minister said, well, brother, you know, I said our love was going to destroy a major city. And so the minister took rest. This is the truth. The minister took rest. I'm in there looking at CNN. And it says, New Orleans in a state of anarchy. The very words the minister gave me that we put in the press release, that when you don't allow people to address their grievance, you put them in a state of anarchy. And my God, when I seen that, I wanted to go and tell the minister when he was taking rest. And everything he said, Allah blessed us to be a witness bearer. That story had never been told publicly, but I knew, and Allah knew that if this leader gave me a message, because I've always been one of his top men and those on the F team. See, one thing about us, if the minister tell us to hook that flea up to that truck, I'll be hooking a flea up to a truck. I wouldn't question him. So Allah used those who would not change what the minister gave. And I stood firm on what the minister gave me. And I became a witness bearer of one of the greatest, greatest catastrophes that God has put, other than this one we're going through now, on New Orleans. And I want to thank you, brother student minister. You was with me all the way. You helped me and you're a witness bearer too, brother student minister Willie. And you was wise enough to get the believers out of New Orleans. Did we lose any believers under Katrina, brother minister Willie? No, sir, by Allah's grace, we didn't. That's what I'm talking about. So, and what was interesting, what you said about the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan saying, and that give you the words talking about the press conference saying that how the city will fall into a state of anarchy in Mayor Nagin's book in the opening pages he talks about. That's the exact words that he used. But I just found it interesting how the words that the minister gave you from out of the New Testament where Jesus tells his disciples how to respond when they go into a town where their efforts are rejected. 
the same words, those are the same words that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan gave you when your efforts to work with the New Orleans Police Department and the community would have been for the benefit of the whole because the next, the next time the New Orleans Police Department was in the news was when Danza Jabrez shooting, but before that, when they were beating up this retired teacher in the French quarters. So who knows that if they would have not allowed one member of the Jewish community to stop you from doing something that could have benefited the city, maybe those officers could have been in that training that could have been avoided. So Kevin, we got a few more minutes I'm, we're gonna do. We first we'll see if, if we're gonna see if anybody, anybody has any questions, you can do it on Facebook. Uh, and I'm gonna open up there, you know, they have something like the white supremacists and people, geez, they be hijacking these, these rooms, but if they are, we'll just get rid of them. But if you have any questions, post your questions in the uh, chat room. And I'll, I'll do that in the meantime. Let me see, I'm open it up for everyone in the public. So you're gonna see some of the people, they were early on with the profanity, but we took care of them, we, we, we booted them out. But if you have any questions, you can post any questions. And while you're waiting, Cap, you were also there when the Honorable Minister Lewis Farrakhan doing it, the, what I refer to it as the historic Million Man March. Can you talk about that? Oh, man, my God, Brother Minister. I was blessed, me and Mammy on the, on the F team. Me and Minister Conrad brought the minister to uh, New York, the minister to Jacob Jarvis mentioned to 25,000 that he would come back and do an all men's only meeting. He came back and uh, we brought him to the 369th Armory. And I'm telling you, brother, we packed every black man in there with a shoe on. The place hold 10,000, we squeezed 12 and we had to turn about 10,000 away. The line was so long that it went up the street and went across the Third Avenue Bridge into the Bronx. And when the minister finally came out to speak, they was hollering, fire con, fire con, fire con, fire. And it sound like it sounded like a movie, a prison. It looked like a prison, man, you know? And the minister I never forget with his beautiful, beautiful, humble self. He said, even though I thank you for your love, for your brother Farrakhan, but Farrakhan would live and Farrakhan would die. But Allah lives forever. So we say, Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. And everybody chanting, Allah Akbar. Man, I'm telling you, brother. And it was in that speech that the minister said, I would like to take a million men to DC. And you heard what the minister said before. He knew it before the words left his mouth. He couldn't call it back. And so we were there and we went all around the country doing men only meeting. And I'm telling you every city, it was packed with men, every city. I think the largest men only meeting was in Houston, Texas. Brother Captain, former Captain, Regional Captain Khalil, it was so many at 30,000 outside. But the minister did his work for a whole year. And now the day have come, October the 16th on a Monday, to see will God bless him with a million men. And brother, I'm telling you, so help me God, under the former Supreme Captain Sharif, we the team set in meetings with every law enforcement agency in this country. I heard one Capitol Police said, listen, we had meetings here before, you know, we had the Vietnam protest, da da da. We're gonna put these little strips, easement for I'm looking at it. And he said it with such arrogance, like this ain't nothing new to us. <laughs> so they agreed to allow us to house the minister in the Capitol. So because, you know, we got the minister in the Capitol, you know, we want to have security in the Capitol on our man. So you can see 
the backdrop on the stairs, the cap, not the stairs, the cap, we covered this another area that we had the FOI. That day, man, when that sun rose up, you can look in the sun, but you can look at like all these eyeballs out there. You can't really see as dark as all outdoors. Man, but when that sun rose, brother minister, we seen black men. Far as the eye can see. My God, man, it was a beautiful sight. Mm. Wow. We brought the minister into the Capitol through the back way. So he didn't see what was out there. He's sitting there, you know, and we already didn't see what's out there. And so one of these, uh, I don't know, Senator Congress, he had an office. If you look at the Capitol, there's these little slots. These are windows up in the dome of the Capitol. He sent a message to Supreme, Supreme Captain Sharif and said, Ask the minister, would he like to come and take a look at this? This got to be the most beautiful sight. So, brother, I remember Brother Sabrina said, Brother Minister, you can take a look and see what they look like. The congressman got an office right up there, and you can open them, you can look. So the minister said, yes, yes, brother. So we took the minister up there, and we go all the way up into the dome. I'm standing right behind the minister. On his, I'm standing on his left. When they opened up that window, man, the minister looked. And he seen black men as far as the eye can see. Now everybody looking at the minister, because we getting ready, you know, we think the minister gonna say, we think the minister gonna say, you know, we think the minister gonna say, well. Look what we've done, and look what I've done. And the minister said these words as if he was talking to a second party. Mm. They either my ears was not here, or I'm putting some stuff, but I heard the minister says, no. To God be the glory. Wow. I know what I heard. No, to God be the glory. So, wait, Cal, so you're saying that at the height of a million plus men, coming out there, and at one point they started yelling, they started chanting Farrakhan, Farrakhan, that the minister didn't seek this as an opportunity to say, look at what I have done. You're saying that he gave all of the glory to God. He said it, man, I'm sitting there listening to him. This before he went down. Mm -hmm. Because if you remember the final call newspaper, the next day was titled, To God Be the Glory. Mm. When he said, to God be the glory, I'm saying to myself, he ain't taking no praise. He's not even celebrating it. Mm -hmm. And then I said to myself, brother, man, what kind of man is this? Because, man, he was beating the minister up in the press for six months. They were dogging the minister. Mm -hmm. Man, if that was me, brother, minister, listen here, man. And I would told those brothers, is in sight, kill everything white, and it's not in sight, it's not right. But clearly that's why God didn't choose me. Yeah. But my minister, man, he wouldn't take credit for it. And when we walked him, the greatest thing that in my life is walking him down those capital steps. Looked like we was floating coming down those steps, man. Historic picture. Oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. I'll never forget that, that moment. Yeah, yeah. And then the Capitol Police Chief, this dude had to come to me Talking about, hey man, could you tell your guys let me into the Capitol? The fruit had locked the chief of the Capitol out. He had to come to me to get clearance. Mm -hmm. He sure enough didn't want to make no bones at that crowd. He never seen nothing like that before. Mm -hmm. And that man that day was the greatest day of our lives. Mm -hmm. The minister did not waste no time talking and talking about his distractors. If you listen to that speech, he wasted no time talking about what they said, what they didn't say. Just look at it. He didn't waste no time. Wow, that's a good point. And what a man we have in Farrakhan, man. That's true, man. It's, you know, uh, 
there's somebody asked a question, but if they don't, if after you ask this question, if there's no other questions, we got we we gotta talk about another part is related to the Million Man March. I think people need to hear that story too, that took place in New York. You know what I'm talking about. But one brother asked a question, Cap. He said that how are the uh how are police departments able to get the training that you offer? Well, you know, um, I don't go through the police department. I go through community organizations who have a rapport with the police department that know Brother Dennis. If you know me and you got somewhat of a relationship and you want to see these officers get this training, then you be the one invite me to them. You tell them about me. I don't go to police department seeking no contract. I want to be honest with you. I have met, this is the God's truth, some wonderful, wonderful white police commanders who have been a friend, not only to the nation, but to Brother Dennis. And I honor and respect these commanders, men over these troops who seen the value of our training as the fruit of Islam. They see our value. And many of these law enforcement commanders, they desire to have disciplined group of men under their charge like we have with the FOI. And I heard one of these commanders said, man, Captain Mama, all my life, I've been trying to get my men to be like those brothers. They admire us because of our discipline. And nobody who's in charge of any man who won't want great disciplined men under their charge. So we was always honored and respected. And we gave them nothing but the proper handling of people. Because we are truly the masters of the proper handling of people. Wow. So, you know, yes, brother, I don't want to be brought in by them. I want to be brought in by community leaders who have a rapport with them. I want you to look good, you to represent and say, see, it's our man. Right. We need them. I'm not trying to train no police. I just, to be honest with you, daddy, I don't really have a desire to do that no more. Mm. I really, really, really don't. And Cap, you, a brother asked a question. He said, were you present when the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan told the brother Sharif that if something were to break out, that he was going to be down there with his people and for nobody not to put their hands on him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we was there. Minister made it very clear. Don't you grab me, brother. You ain't taking me nowhere. Mm. I'm going to fight and die with my people. Yes, that's what he said. Yes, he said. Now look. You know, we, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish that. You finish. You know, you know, I'm not as concerned to get him out the way. I'm sure that's what Brother Supreme Captain Sharif in mind was doing. No. Man, the minister liked the thunk. <laughs> so Nobody look, like a better fight than the minister, brother. Believe me when I say that. Wow. So we're gonna close out on this. You gotta tell this story. We know that, and it just it's public record. I mean, it is what it is. We know that Jesse Jackson wasn't on board for the Million Man March in the beginning. But can you show? Because in this story, what I get out of how what appears to be a negative situation, good can come out of it. So can you close out on that story? Yes, that's, that, that story got, my, got me a whooping from the minister. But I got to tell you the good, bad, and ugly. Well, you know, brother, one day I'm riding around in Harlem. This is why the minister rearing up the Million Man March. Reverend Jackson and Reverend uh, Sharpton was at the uh, hotel, Gary Bird show here in New York. In New York. And I remember uh, Gary Bird asked Jesse, he says, are you going to go? to the Million Man March. And Reverend Jack said, go there for what? To atone for what? I ain't never did nothing against my wife, which we know that was not true. They don't want a love child popped about it in the closet. But anyway, so much for that. But when I heard that, I really got upset because I watched the minister Get in trouble with the Jews defending Jesse. Mm. To this day, they hate him because of Jesse. He defended his brother. And the minister had been trying to reach Reverend Jackson to get him to endorse the Million Mind March. And Reverend Jackson wouldn't even take the minister's phone call. I knew this. And so uh, I heard one Sunday, I'm talking to the men. 
And I get a letter that Minister Conrad wants me to join him across the street at Silvius to greet Jesse and Shakti. I said, oh, snap. They're going to be across the street in my mind. Now, now, Minister Conrad didn't know what was in my mind. I said, look here, soldiers. So we're going across the street. And I want us to make a line from the door to the curb. Men on both sides. When Reverend Jackson get out that car, I want you to give him the meanest look that you can give him. Don't say nothing to him. Don't put your hands. Just growl at him. <laughs> so I goes over to Sylvia's, right? I goes in to Sylvia. The minister the car read in there, right? So I'm telling him what I'm getting ready to do. He said, man, you crazy. Cap, man, what you getting? Cap, man, look at you. And before I know, a brother comes over to me and say, hey, they just pulled up, Cap. Kyrie, look at, don't do this, don't do this, B. Man, I go out the door, and as soon as I go out the door, Reverend Jackson and Jesse gets out, uh, Reverend Jackson, get, I mean, uh, uh, Shopton gets out first. He walks through what I call the gauntlet. He walks through, man, he could tell, you know, some kind of iffy. But then when Jackson get out, he throws his thumb up, brothers, and man, he looking at the brothers, the brothers turning their back on it. He go to shake the hand, they ain't shaking the hand. They gave him a cold reception. As we was coming, as he was coming through the door, Reverend Jackson says, Captain, I should remember Jackson and asked, I need to talk to you. So Jesse reached his hand and said, Captain, I don't shake his hand. So, 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 so Shopped and I, we talking. Jesse, he goes, you know, he's with Minister Kyron. He kind of like, he don't like what's happening. So I'm talking to Reverend Jackson. I'm Reverend I'm shopping. I said, hey, shop, let me tell you what I said to him. I said, look here. I said, if y'all ain't got nothing good, man, to say about the million man march, don't say nothing at all. So shop said, man, Captain, I'm with the million man march. I, you know, so then Jesse comes back over. I'm sitting down. Jesse puts his hand back out. Like, shake your hand, Captain. I look at, I look at Jesse's hand. I turn away. And I want him to hear what I said to Shopton. And I said it loud. Like I said, if you ain't got nothing good to say about the Million Man March, don't say nothing at all. Jesse walks, walks away, and now he's upset. He says, Brother Conrad, Brother Conrad told me, he said, Brother, they said, shut up, Conrad. I know intimidation. This is what Conrad said. I know intimidation when I feel it. He calls Mrs. Woods. And so then this brother named Carl Reddy, and he was the driver who just, he comes over to me. He said, Captain, he said, you can't dish the Reverend like that. And I'm going to be honest with what I said. I ain't, I've been told the truth. This I, these are my words. I said, he's lucky we don't kick his ass up in here. That's what I said. I ain't going to lie. That's what I said. Now, I didn't say that to Jesse. I said it to Carl, the driver. Now, he went back and told Red, right? So Shopton said, hey, Cam, you know, uh, Jesse want to leave. I'm not going to do nothing to him. I said, oh, no, I ain't going to put my hands on it. But he got to go through that gauntlet again, right? Man, this dude leaves and man, he gets in the car. They take off the mother. La, wa, ba, la, wa, ba. Man, the next day, I get a phone call from the leader. Sister Sophia, his secretary, calls. I'm at the mosque. I'm an anchor, brother Captain Dennis. She says, well, next line. This sister Sophia, hold on for Minister Fogg. I said, oh, snap. <laughs> Minister comes on. I'm an anchor. Brother Dennis, you on the line? Yes, sir, brother Minister. Brother Conrad, you on the line? Yes, sir, brother Minister. He named a couple of people. I'm not going to mention their names. <laughs> He said, Brother Dennis, Reverend Jackson called me last night. He said he was in New York. And he's putting it out to all of the preachers that we, the Muslims, threaten his life. And the preachers are pulling out the million man mark. Now, what happened, brother? I said, oh, snap. And then, then my man, Brother Conrad, took an opportunity to throw a dig on me. See, I told you, Brother Minister, he was, he was off the chain here. Shut up, Conrad. Now tell me, brother, what did you do? So I said, Brother Minister, 
I said, well, nobody gave me instructions. I was hurt by the minister. Reverend Jackson got on the radio. I told him what Reverend Jackson said. And I said, I was hurt because, Brother Minister, you've, you've did everything. You've shown no signs that you do. I know you love Reverend Jackson. So we just had a silent protest, Brother Minister. I never said nothing to Reverend Jackson. Never. I just didn't shake his hand, Brother Minister. He said, Brother, he said, the devil can pop Jesse and lay that at our doorstep. And we could be living the Malcolm era again. I said, oh, this is getting bad for me now. Now I'm getting ready to plead to the mercy of the court. All that tough stuff that was in me, then I'm wah, wah, wah. Uh, uh, Brother Minister, uh, whatever you want me to do, sir, uh, you want to bust me, you want to do a press conference, I, I apologize, Brother Minister. Minister in his beautiful way, so my brother, you ain't got to do all that. And then he said to the other person on the phone, he said, well, one thing, brother, he did call us. We got him to call us. <laughs> so that was a good part. So um, right after that, brother, right after that, I had to go and meet. this, And i never forget this meeting. I had to apologize. The minister flew me, in, flew me into Chicago. And I'm in the room. Look who I'm in the room with. Joseph Lowry. The great Clay Evans, just the great pastor past in, in Chicago, the minister did his eulogy, and, and he was the mentor of Martin Luther King, the great Bishop Brookings, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 we have a man, Chavis, Bevel, um, that other preacher be traveling with the minister sometime, I can't think of Al, yeah, well, yeah. Willie Wilson. Really was it, but Al, Al, his name was Al something. Al Sam, Samson. Yeah, Al Samson. And I mean, it was full. And then Jesse had Jonathan, his son. And the word was out, Jonathan wanted to see the man who had threatened his father. So he was there with, had his little grit on his face, you know? Now, you know, I'm in the room with the minister, all of, uh, you know, uh, the Supreme, Mustafa, Sharif. Uh, all of the top ladies. I'm in the room, so the room is packed, right? <laughs> oh, God. So the minister says, brothers, I told you and I promised you that I would get to the bottom of this, and I brought Brother Dennis here so he could tell the story. Now, Reverend Jackson had kind of added a little yeast to the game. So they would listen to his version. Like I told him this and I was we gonna do it. I, I ain't never talked to him. I didn't say a word to this man. But as the story was going around, they were saying he this, this, that, and the rather he said it now, I don't know. So then I open up. Now this is this is before the million man march. So this is in the spirit of atonement. Mm. My words was to my leader, Honorable Minister Farrakhan, to you, Reverend Jackson, and to you, Reverend Sharpton. First, Reverend Shop, first, I would like to apologize to you, Reverend Shopton, for any of this. Reverend Shopton stopped me. He said, Brother, you didn't do nothing to insult me. He stopped me early in the game. And I said, Reverend Jackson, I said, in 1984, this, this is what I said, they wouldn't give you secret service. Mm -hmm. And my leader, gave an order to all FOI that if you was in anywhere in our city to protect you and I pointed at his son and your family. Mm -hmm. I want Jonathan to see that finger and your family. <laughs> I was one of them, Reverend Jackson. And when you repudiated the minister, you hurt us. When you repudiated the minister, a man that loved you, you hurt us. So when you was asked about the Million Man March by Gary Burden, you said what you said, I was hurt. And I took it upon myself, which was not my job to do. And I did nothing to you, Reverend Jackson, but showed you a silent protest. I never said nothing to you, I just didn't shake your hand. 
And because of that, I offended you. I offended my leader. And I'd like to ask you in the spirit of atonement, my brother, forgive me. Would you accept my apology? And then Reverend Jackson said, brother, I accept your apology. But I too was offended by a member of the nation. And he talked about Brother Collie. Brother Collie used to be hard on Jesse. And then Jesse went to tell the story how him and the minister did Christmas together, how they love each other, and that it is and that it is. Of course, he accepted it. Oh, but when he got to the minister, the minister wore my behind out. He said, Brother, he said, that act could have caused so much harm. And brother, even though you were sincere in your intentions, sometimes we let our emotions get the better of us. I forgive you, brother. But let this be a lesson. And so the minister says something, then after that, now here's the piece. Y'all need to hear this piece. All right, y'all gotta hear this piece. I can't tell this story without adding this other piece that was there. Can, can I do that? Yes, sir. Go ahead. We got a couple of minutes. <clears throat> so, so after they got through and we, you know, we, 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 we settled that and, you know, we laid at the bed. They Jesse accepted my child apology. Brother accepted my minister. So Jesse said, we got one more order of business, brother minister. I'd like to bring up. He said, one, Bob Johnson, the, 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 the owner at that time of BET called me and he said, the brothers beat up one of his comedians. Now we know about the story. We know what happened. And um, we like to know, brother minister, if the brothers, uh, do you know about that? So the minister, man, I love this man. Minister, yes, sir, brother. I I know this. I know what happened from the report I got. This comedian came out. It was talking about Mike Tyson, who got converted to Islam in the prison. That was the joke. And he made a reference that, can you imagine Mike Tyson, a Quran in one hand, and a Playboy magazine in the other? And he talked about masturbating a lot. Anyway, it was very distasteful. And then that wasn't the problem. And then he said he liked pork so much that he would spit the pork bone in Farrakhan's face. And that's what he said. And of course, when that comedian did say that, it was live on BET. Guess who was in the audience when he made that statement? <laughs> the Supreme Captain Mustafa. He didn't know that. And Lord have mercy, when he made that statement, why did that boy make that statement? But anyway, so the minister said these words. I'm going to tell you what the minister said. He said, brother, there's a man who named Solomon Rosti. This man is in hiding to this day because he made a hit and a reference of disrespect to Prophet Muhammad. He's in hiding to this day. He said, what that man said, if that would have been played on the air, all the Muslims in the world, we said all the Muslims, but it came after that man and his family. And what he said, he needed his ass whooped, and the brothers whooped his ass. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and we're looking at brother. Hey, boy, boy, boy. All them preachers said, you should have heard, Reverend. Reverend one of them, Reverend, Reverend, Reverend I said, yeah. Well, if he'd have said that about the Christian, we'd have whooped his ass too. Let's move on to the next stage. And that was it of that, man. That was it of that. But the minister said he saved his life. Because if that would have got out. And of course, you know, that was it of that. <laughs> and man, the minister said it. I mean, the minister ain't back now. Yeah. And then what he said was real quiet in there. But the other preacher said, yeah, I like that fact. Because if he'd have said that about our God, we'd have whooped it. You know, blah, blah, blah. So anyway. Nevertheless, so we yeah, move to the true. next meeting. They meet with Jesse. The Christians, do we have this picture? And they said, Chris, the Christians said, Jesse, 
Farrakhan supported you. Now it's time for you to support Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. And they went at Jesse so hard and just said, okay, I endorsed the Million Man March. And Jesse that day endorsed the Million Man March. And Jesse spoke to those men at the Million Man March. And as Jesse was coming out of the Capitol building and he seen me, <laughs> this is the truth, right when he's getting ready to go speak, he stuck his hand out for me to shake it. This time I'm gonna shake his hand, right? When I went to shake Jesse and he pulled his hand back on me. And they looked at me and said, we're going to call that the New York Dish. And he moved on out. <laughs> All right, brother. Wow. But you got me back, Jesse. You got me back. And the rest yes, is history, family. Well, well Kat, we, we thank you for the time that you have given. There's a S Sister Vivian. She, she's been enjoying it. Since you asked the question about the LLC, Brother Captain Dennis doesn't really know, uh, can like answer that. But if you are, whatever city you're in, let me know what city you're in. We can connect you to the local organizing committee in your actual city, all right? So for you all who are, who, brother, brother Desmond, our brother from Atlanta, thank you for coming on and helping us. We want to thank those who are on Zoom and even those who are on Facebook as well who have been watching it. And we're going we're gonna to do more of these, especially while we're in this... Um, in this, in this, in this, in this, what is shut down, shut in, right? And while we're doing this, so we thank you, Cap. And now, what, I, what I'm, what I'm most proud about, now we have those stories that we talked about, especially the one as it relates to New Orleans. We have it recorded, and it's there for, for history when, it, when they come back and look at it. Do you have any uh, closing words? Well, let me say this, um, brother minister. I thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Believers, please um, forgive my language. I know it's Ramadan and I use words that, you know, we could have had put a little bit more, you know, flowers on it. But Brother Minister asked me to keep it 100 and I, I don't know no other way mm -hmm. to give it to you. I'm, none of us is perfect. But I want to say, dear believers, in this very, very dark hour, we are truly blessed as the world is going into a state of anarchy and chaos. We are not only observing Ramadan, but as we are in our homes now, we got our minds looking to one direction every Sunday as we listen to Minister Ishmael. Believers, I create this to the caterpillar that here we go into this quarantine, a very ugly, in our manner, ugly, in our attitude, ugly in our habits. And we go into our quarantine home, which is a cocoon. But this is a deep part that we need to understand about the caterpillar going through his metamorphosis. He's going through a transition, and that's what we're going through. But something that the Honorable Minister Farrakhan said about that caterpillar, that if it eats the right leaf, it produced the right silk, which will allow it to produce the right cocoon that it needs to protect itself as it goes through its metamorphosis, as it goes through its stage of development. He said, with the, with the, with the caterpillar leaf eat, it's very important. And it's out of that transition that the caterpillar is in his most vulnerable state because he's going from what he knows to some unknown. Mm. I said, that's us, family. We go into these homes, these quarantine with every bad habit, every bad attitude, every, we just as ugly as that caterpillar in our ways, but check this out. The, the leaf represents the food. Well, we had got a diet before this quarantine from Savior's Day and then Sunday the ministers spoke at, at, at the mile. And it was that diet that gave us the faith. See, the cocoon is the faith as our brother, Ishmael was talking. See, the cocoon is our faith. It is our faith that protects us in this vulnerable hour. But if your faith is weak, if you partake of another type of teachings and you allow this enemy in which you see on the news and you believe him, it's time to go out and you follow him, then not only do you have a weak cocoon, but your cocoon becomes unraveled. And once your cocoon becomes unraveled, they say it makes it easy for other insects to come in and abort the mission of that caterpillar. How strong is your faith? That means how strong is your cocoon? And let me tell you something, believers. 
when this thing over it, and if it gets over, when we come out, we're not coming out looking like that ugly caterpillar because during this transition, we're getting rid of all our bad habits. We're going back to eat one meal a day. We're going back to following the teaching. When we come out of this cocoon, we're not going to be like the caterpillar and become the butterfly. But we come out of this being a people beautified. We're going to be a beautified people. And no longer will we be limited by our Lord desires. No longer will we be bound by the gravitational pull of this earth. We will be able to sow, believers. And Allah is making us qualified, bona fide, and satisfied to do what? To build the kingdom of God right here on earth. That's the only business after this. It's to establish the kingdom of God right here on earth. And God has purified us and purged us to make us fit to build his kingdom. Oh, we're going to be a beautified people when we get through with this. I just want to say that to you, believers. Keep the faith. Thank you. Thank Don't you. let your faith unravel. Keep the faith. That's what I wanted to say, Brother Minister. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. We thank you for your testimony. And what we're going to try to do, as I said, we're going to try to do these, and inshallah, God willing. Uh, on every Sunday, you know, the next one we're going to get Brother Desmond. I already spoke to our brother, Brother Abdul, and we're going to uh, have him on, inshallah, on next next Sunday. We can talk about, I'm not going to talk about the book. We want people to get the book, but we're going to talk about some stuff that, some questions that came as a result of the book. Thank you, Brother Captain, and thank everybody thank who's really on. And uh, may, may, may God bless you all with a beautiful day. And to the Muslims who are observing Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak. And this is, this, cause, this is the end of this I Have a Testimony. Thank you.